Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 294, Dr. Joanne Brandt on the Gospel According to John, Part 2. In this episode, the second half of my conversation with Dr. Joanne Brandt, author of a unique commentary on the fourth gospel. Dr. Brandt, welcome back to the Trinity's podcast. Thank you. I enjoyed our first discussion and look forward to this one. Yeah, so this will tie in with some of the things that we were talking about, you know, how high is the Christology in this gospel, for instance. And this is such an intriguing book, and it's it's almost, the first chapter to me is almost like a playground for interpreters and literary and textual critics to ply their trade on, because it's such a strange opening. Yeah. The tone of it violently shifts right in the middle, and is this poetry, is this a pre-existing thing that John has now scotch-taped onto the start of his gospel? What is happening here? And I'm going to bring up some, I think, very different interpretations that uh, people have come up with, but you're the author of a very interesting, insightful commentary on John, so I want to know how you approach it. I think we mentioned last time that you do decide to treat it. I guess the the series of commentaries kind of does this as well, right? To Let's just go with the final version that we've had passed down to us. And let, let's go with that and let's interpret that and not go off endlessly about how there could have been five editions of this and four different hands in it and things like this. So you, you treat this as a composition of the same author as the rest of the book. Yeah. You don't see it as kind of tacked on, do you? No, it is an unusual beginning and a little bit jarring because of the poetic form. And so you have this sort of jarring transitions between poetry and prose at, at times. But one looks at its function, it serves as an introduction in many ways. The one creating an audience and drawing us from the present to the past so it is a lovely lead-in into the narrative. It calls our attention right away, which is something that the opening line of a, an ancient work would have to do. It has to demarcate the beginning of an address, because we're talking about not a, a piece of literature that somebody re- is reading by themselves in their room, but is listening to, either reading it or reciting it from memory. Mm -hmm. Many ancient works are written with the understanding that they're going to be circulated, published in an oral format. And I think the author was writing with that in mind. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, so it kind of starts off with high drama. Yeah. In Greek, NRK, in the beginning. Yeah. And like most commenters, you take that to be the Genesis beginning, right? Yes, and so... It begins with this, in a way, it's a sort of a bait and switch. And the audience, when they hear in the beginning, is anticipating perhaps a sustained quotation from Genesis. And then all of a sudden you have this word that in the beginning was the logos. And I think it's designed in a way, I don't think it, the word logos was necessarily something that the audience would have immediately associated with Christ. I I suspect it's a word that is chosen in order to grab attention. Well, he's not called the Logos anywhere in the rest of this book. Yeah. Or in the rest of the New Testament, except for one place in Revelation, right? Yeah. And I think the word is used as a way of drawing people in, making them wonder what is going to happen and what what will be explained to them. And it has so many associations, so it, it lets the audience begin to do a sort of a free play word association on their own. But then by the end of the prologue, you have the identification of who the Logos is. And once that happens, once the Logos is identified as Jesus, you don't need this particular term anymore. 
because who Jesus is has now been defined. The gospel writer has to struggle because there is no language to describe who Jesus is before the incarnation. So he chooses a word that it's not a metaphor. It's a word that you can fill with all sorts of different meaning, but it demarcates something that is ultimately not explainable. So it's a substitute word for who Jesus is until Jesus is incarnate. And then you, ha- then you can use metaphors and then you can use titles in Jesus' name and move to something much more concrete. Okay, so you're taking the word to be the pre-human Jesus. Yeah. Which is, I think, how most interpreters take it. Other than Genesis 1, do you see any Old Testament background here that you think the author is expecting the audience to sort of bring in when they understand this? Because the Word of God is mentioned, you know, God speaks in Genesis 1, and then Psalm 33, 6 has God creating by His Word. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's maybe a couple other places, and there's there's a few places where the word is personified and does things. Anyway, yeah, is there other background other than Genesis 1 that you see? I suspect that those texts are informing the meaning. I think the intended audience is one that treats the Old Testament as authoritative. Mm-hmm. The author wants to invoke the authority of the Scripture, and in doing that, put the audience at ease. So what he's going to say is going to be new, but it's going to stand in continuity with what they think is authoritative, which is Hebrew scriptures. And I do think that the best place to begin in thinking about what the Logos is, is with the wisdom tradition, and not fishing out there too far into the Greco-Roman world. Mm -hmm. But also allows anybody who is steeped in the more speculative theology that is informed by Greco-Roman thought, such as that of Philo of Alexandria. It allows them to fill it in with whatever they want to fill it in with, but pretty soon you have to drop all of that and just move to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to remember that it is an oral medium, and it's moving along at quite a clip. And the point is to draw you along through the story. So when you mentioned the wisdom literature, did you have in mind um, like Proverbs 8, where wisdom is with God in the beginning and uh, Mm -hmm. sort of with almost kind of like helping God with creation, although it doesn't quite say that? Yes. Yeah. That sense that there's a confidence in the divine order. And it's not quite Philo's idea of God creating a blueprint and then... uh, two-stage creation, doing the blueprint, and then creating the created order, but that that there is an expression of orderliness, that there is a wisdom in creation itself. So I, I see the same thing in Job as well, when God steps in and talks about that, we're there at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so later on, there is a tradition of kind of bringing together talk about God's wisdom with talk about God's word. Mm-hmm. I remember there's one text in the intertestamental literature where wisdom is talking as in Proverbs 8, and she says, I came out of the mouth of the Lord. Well, that would make her God's word as well. So you see this as a wisdom Christology, like God's wisdom is in Christ? Yes. We struggle to figure out what sort of technical terminology to use to describe what's going on, but there does seem to be room within theology at this point to think about emanations or hypostasis of the deity, things that are are participating in the divine, but somehow are they separate from the divine. And so Jesus fits into that tradition. Mm. When the Trinity's podcast returns, I ask Dr. Brandt about the so-called Socinian interpretation of the prologue. 
want to ask you a question that you might think this is a little bit out of left field, but um, a couple of episodes ago in this podcast, I interviewed a scholar who was a PhD in New Testament, at one time a student of James Dunn, and he has a radically different take on the prologue, and he thinks that the beginning that's referred to is just kind of like the beginning of the gospel era, because that's how Mark starts out, it says NRK. And even in this book, I think later somewhere, Jesus says, you know, I've been with you since the beginning. And um, sometimes people will read 1 John 1, and they see a mention of beginning, and they, they take it that way. How would you rule that out? Why would you be sure that this is a Genesis beginning and not this other beginning of this new deal? I tend not to want to rule anything out. I like to keep ideas in play. Mm-hmm. On this one, I will freely confess that you know, I'm just influenced very much by the weight of tradition. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I have encountered that idea before that we shouldn't be treating this as a reference to Genesis 1, but just the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Mm-hmm. It's a reading from the Socinians in the Radical Reformation. They say uh, he was in the beginning with God. That would be like a pre-ministry fellowship with God, like maybe in the wilderness or something. And then all things tapanta came through or were done through him. And without him was not one thing I think they would say done. And uh, Mm -hmm. I guess tapanta would be, well, it could be all believers, like sometimes is in Paul, or it could be kind of all things that were done relating to the gospel or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they just, they take the whole thing as to be about the human Jesus. There seems to be a consensus among commenters that, no, this is just obviously Genesis. Like, how could anybody take it any other way? Mm-hmm. Well, it seems to me that the all things that come into being, later on it talks about the world came into being. That doesn't make sense to me if it's talking about the man. Yeah. So, as you point out in your commentary, verses 1 through 5, uh, that ends with the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. That's Mm -hmm. in this really grandiose, big opening style. And now all of a sudden, you know, he slams on the brakes and now, oh, and then there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And Mm -hmm. now we're back to this real plain prose. Mm -hmm. But, and then we go back to the grand style (laughs) for the, for the finale. But you don't see this as evidence of cutting and pasting and multiple authors. This makes sense to you on the level of rhetoric. Yeah, it makes sense on the level of rhetoric. It doesn't make sense on the level of poetry, that's for sure. And Mm -hmm. this sort of aside or interruption, you know, imagine if he was delivering this to some extent in imagining an oration, these bold poetic declamations or the encomium about Jesus. I've come to think of this as sort of like giving the audience a break. Because you've been bombarded with these high lofty thoughts. And now all of a sudden you get to breathe for a second Mm -hmm. as you move from this very lofty language and abstract language to something very concrete. Mm -hmm. And actually all he's saying is, look, I'm not the only one who said this. I have this other authority here, you know, who's making the same sort of claims about Jesus. There's two ways of looking at it. He's saying, I'm not the one who said this, John the Baptist, this other authority have said this. So the audience, you know, if somebody comes and starts speaking this way, there's an inclination to say, who are you to make these claims? Mm-hmm. He shifts it over to John making these claims rather than him making these claims. Mm-hmm. Or he's lifting John up as a proof. I think it may be a clumsy use of what is acceptable rhetorical device. So if an ancient order was critiquing this, they'd look and say, you could have done this a little bit in a less jarring way by Mm -hmm. moving something middle style rather than going straight down to prose. Mm -hmm. But there's a logic to what's going on. He wants to use the high prestige of John as this great prophet to help his case, but at the same time, it looks like he's trying to take John down a notch. Yeah, that's a very popular theory, because we do know from Josephus that people knew who John the Baptist was, and it's highly questionable that Josephus knew who Jesus was. Mm. So 
The Baptist movement continues after John the Baptist dies. We don't have enough documentation to know fully what people were thinking, but but in, at least his ministry of baptism is continuing. People are still preparing for the coming of the Lord through John the Baptist's ministry. They're still participating in a Baptist baptism ministry of some sort. Mm-hmm. His story is known, and Jesus' story isn't as well known. I don't think of the gospel necessarily as a tool for conversion, but it does inspire the people who are hearing it to engage in spreading the gospel. So I still think conversion happens by people listening to a gospel being read to them and then them converting. But there is that evangelical edge to this, this missional edge. But are they dissing John the Baptist or just building on his reputation is the question. And I don't think I would say that this is trying to downplay the prominence of the Baptist. I do think that the gospel is seeking to place them on a proper relationship that might not be one that is well understood. Mm. Well, I mean, it would only be dissing him relative to Jesus, right? He's not the true light, but Jesus and I don't is. Think, yeah, I don't think anybody was claiming that he was the Messiah. Hmm. Well, Josephus is very cautious about what he says about who the Baptist is. You know, he's trying to explain Judaism in a way that makes it less threatening to the Roman world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the more apocalyptic John the Baptist is not the John the Baptist he's presenting. Mm-hmm. But my default argument is we don't have enough material with which to make the argument. <laughs> mm. Well, I mean, it's always fair to point out that we don't have a fair sample of a lot of things. I find yes. this is a terrible problem in the second century mm-hmm. to when, um, you know, the things that have been preserved are the things that, you know, in the four and five and six hundreds were liked, like yes. Justin Martyr, but you don't have, you know, for instance, any of the Monarchian material, mm-hmm. which we know is mainstream, even in places like Rome for some decades. But you can hardly find a scrap from those actual people. It's all their enemies heaping scorn on them. Yeah. Not to mention the obscurity of all the Gnostic stuff. I mean, what will you give for another uh, 20 documents from that century? You know, How much would that change? I don't know. Change mm-hmm. our views. When the Trinity's podcast returns, we return to the subject of the Word in John 1. In your view, the the author is calling Jesus the Word here, and that's not a usual name, but you think he's sort of teasing the audience in a way? There's an intentional ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So keeping the mind of the audience a little bit restless until you move into the narrative. Mm -hmm. So them intrigued. Mm -hmm. Now there's another less traditional interpretation which would take the word to just, that's just God's word, like we know it from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And then it's just talking about God's word, at least up until you get to either 10 or 14 or roundabouts later in the passage. And uh, so that just be God's word that's in the beginning with God, like Lady Wisdom and all things came Mm -hmm. into being through him, but it's just like a personification. And so then the word quote becomes flesh, but then it's not, it's not incarnation. It's It's just God's word being embodied in this man, like to a greater degree than the prophets, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's actually how I, how I want to take the whole thing, partly because I'm worried about verse one, the third clause. So clearly the subject of verse one is halagos. It's the word. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And there are three claims that this that this word was already there in the beginning. I agree that it's the Genesis creation myself. Uh, it's it's already there in the beginning, and it's with God. Mm, that's interesting. And then it says in Greek, uh, "Theos ein halagos," mm-hmm. and God was the word. Yeah. And, uh, mm, that's that's kind of a uh, that's kind of a blockbuster claim. Uh, yeah. What could that mean? I was just mentioning the Monarchians. I've done some research about this, trying to figure out how this was interpreted pre-Nicene Creed. Mm-hmm. And I've done a lot of reading in the Logos theorists and, you know, like Justin and Origen and Tertullian. And it seems to me that there was a division in their time between people who thought that the same, okay, when it says the word was God, is that the same God that was mentioned before or is it a different God? Mm-hmm. And the Logos theorists said it was a it was a second god and another god. Literally, they would say that. Later on, they would kind of back off from those phrases. Like in Irenaeus, he doesn't he doesn't say those things. And yet, in my view, he still has the Logos as a, a second divine being that's lesser than the one true God. And the Monarchians said, no, it's just the same God. And so some of them, as is heavily mocked, uh, collapsed the father and son into the same person. So they're called Patroposians. But then uh, the dynamic monarchians seem to think that the word is just mm, something like a divine power or action. And then it's just that God is acting through the man. So then Mm -hmm. they would take it as um, when it says the word was God, he's basically saying it's not somebody else. It's just God. But then it goes back mm-hmm. to personifying, just like Lady Wisdom. It's not really somebody else, right? It's yeah. if you thought that there was this lady at the creation, that would be a mistaken interpretation, according to all interpreters of sound mind. Uh, when, <laughs> when it comes to Proverbs eight, I see some saying it's the same God as mentioned before, which is the Father, and then other ones saying it's no, it's it's a different God. How would you respond to that kind of take on it? Okay, so what I'll say in conversation, this is probably naive, thinking that what one says in a podcast is different than what one writes in a book. But it always seems a bit more ethereal when one is speaking. But now with modern technology, it's not so ethereal. It it lives on, doesn't it? (laughs) It does, yes. (laughs) I have people discover this podcast two years later, and they listen through all of them. Yeah. So... What you've just said is played with all these possibilities when reading and trying to determine what I was actually going to write. And I do find that idea really engaging, that we're jumping ahead and reading Jesus in too early. Mm. And to some extent, if we didn't have that interruption at sex, Once we introduce John, we have to have another person, I think, against John's not the light. It's Mm -hmm. going to be something else. But you're right that the true light hasn't come into the world yet. Mm -hmm. And then moving to metaphor, and we're not making references to God anymore. And so it's this real difficulty of theology. This is why Judaism avoided a lot of speculative theology. From time to time in the Old Testament, you get references to God that allow you to sort of imagine God walking in the garden and God sitting, uh, reading a book, and then Satan shows up to interrupt his contemplations. But John does open this door to mythology when we get to chapter five, and he starts talking about Jesus' education at the feet of his father his apprenticeship and him having seen God. And so it's that material that tends to allow me to see these references as suggestive of Jesus' presence right away in the prologue. But it is also ambiguous that you can't be certain of anything really until something gets named in concrete terms. Mm-hmm. Or the references start lining up with the history that one knows. So the word becomes flesh in 14. That's incarnational language. And so, and and by that point, you're lining this up with Jesus. 
incarnational in the sense that it's a change in in one and the same self. The, this word is the same self as as Jesus, but now now it's human. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And by the time you get to fourteen, even if you felt any sense of ambiguity about the references at that point, I think that the average reader is or audience member is going to anticipate the name that appears in verse seventeen that this is Jesus is talking about. Mm-hmm. I think that the reader anticipate that all the way back. Mm-hmm. When I was reading your commentary, it almost seemed to me like you didn't say this exactly, but uh, it seemed to me like you were kind of coming down on the side of the logos theorists in, in saying that the word was God, that this is not the same God as mentioned before. Is that, I mean, the, the, the Trinitarian way is to say, uh, look, different persons can be the same God. There's this concept of a multi-personal God and so it's just clearly two hypostases and one who see it. But it seemed to me you weren't willing to bring in those later ideas. And you were treating the Logos as a divine being that derives from God. Yeah, but not, but not the same God as the God from whom he derives. Yeah, some sort of hypostasis, some sort of epiphenomena. But these are all. Greek words that we're using to try and explain something and what sort of language should we use? Uh, Maybe this is why I didn't become a theologian. (laughs) 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 Uh, I see this sort of language as as a trap because as soon as you say it, it makes it sound like you understand what you're talking about. Mm. But I do think that we run into some problems, that there is identification between Jesus and God, but the gospel moves to familial language very soon, and the language of father and son. That does mean that they share an authority, but there is a subordination. Mm-hmm. You see the authority as implying divine nature? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, divine nature or divine work, I think that it's much more concerned with the work Mm. than the question of nature or essence. Mm -hmm. Now, when Jesus gets questions for what he's doing and saying, initially it's for what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And then he justifies what he's doing by virtue of his relationship to God. Mm Mm-hmm. It's relational language. It doesn't say, I'm doing this because I am God. I'm doing this because I'm the son of God. And that gives me authority and it gives me access to God's intention. Yeah, the father loves the son and shows him everything he's doing. And I only do what I see my father doing. And yeah, no, I agree that the emphasis is on function and what sort of things he's truly authorized to do. It seems Mm -hmm. to me the crucial issue throughout the book, even at his trial, but also with the uh, conversation with the Samaritan woman in chapter four and many other places, it's, is this guy really the Messiah or not? Mm -hmm. Is he just somebody who's trying to exalt himself, basically, or trying to gain a following, even maybe try to become a king? Or is this really God's king, God's Mm -hmm. special agent? You talk about that several times in the commentary, this theme of him as God's agent, uh, doing God's works, teaching God's words, and so on, which is consistent with divine Christology or not, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a different topic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, on this topic of the deity of Christ, it's interesting, you, in your translation in verse 18 here, Mm-hmm. Honestly, I think a lot of interpreters are just trying to maximize the number of times that Jesus is called God. Uh, and so they go with the reading like God, the only son, or the only begotten God, things like that. But you actually go with the reading of uh, the only son who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. Yeah. Why did you do that? If you were going to just rigidly stick with the textual critical edition of the Greek, I think you'd probably go with one of the other ones because they they tend to fall on that side thinking it's the more difficult reading. Why did you depart from that tradition? Yeah, why did I? That's a good question. <laughs> well, let me look it up. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if you did say... 
know if I justified that decision and if I can recover the memory of making that decision. I think I was much more distracted by the monogenes, the only begotten and dealing with that whole, you know, how do we avoid using the language of only begotten? You know, I don't think you did explain it. I'm looking at it. It's on pages 34 and 35. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me like this is the the rare place where you have to consider the content of what's being said mm-hmm. and not just the manuscripts. And you can't always just knee-jerk pick the most difficult reading. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this book doesn't say he's the unique God. It says the, the Father is the only true God in chapter 17. And in chapter 20, it says that the Father is his God and our God. Mm-hmm. Um, so why would it, or if you think it has to do with begottenness, I mean, how could you have a begotten God, you know? Yeah. yeah. God in a monotheistic sense is by definition unbegotten. I was imagining maybe you just said, well, this sounds like something John would say, the only, the unique son. Well, and I think that probably guided the thought 10 or however many years ago that I made that decision. That you know, if I sort of step back and think of all those sorts of things that are going on in one's mind and motivations for doing anything. It's always, there are other things coming in. And I can quite recall at that point that I was a little bit frustrated by people wanting to move away from father and son language Mm. and obliterating it all over the place. And I think it's really important. The familial language is really important and we don't want to lose that. Mm Mm-hmm. I've seen some of the other best commenters. Uh, what's that guy, Ritterboss? Mm-hmm. He makes the same judgment. He says, no, it's, it's got to be the only son mm-hmm. in his very theological commentary. Mm-hmm. When the Trinity's podcast returns, does the gospel according to John teach that Jesus is the one true God himself? Going back to Jesus and God in this book, on a popular level, I've always been interested in apologetics and theology, and it seems to me there's a there's a tradition of kind of cherry picking all the parts of this gospel that sound like it's saying that Jesus is God Himself. So, you know, my Lord and my God from chapter twenty, this here verse one, verse eighteen in the prologue. When Jesus says, I am, and interpreting that is like saying, I am, I am God himself. But it seems to me they, they tend to ignore where the book, in my reading, strongly distinguishes between Jesus and God. Mm-hmm. And I think you acknowledge that in your commentary. You do mention the prominent theme of Jesus as God's agent, mm-hmm. uh, doing his bidding, doing his will, uh, bringing the message that God gave him, you know, saying the words that he heard from God. And I already mentioned, you know, the Father is the only true God. The Father is Jesus' God. It looks like if you look at those distinguishing passages, or where he says, um, you know, I don't testify on my own behalf, but there's another who testifies for me, and that's God. These things, as I read them, would preclude Jesus from being the same God that the Father is, because the God of the Jews doesn't have a God and, mm-hmm. you know, can't be doing anybody else's bidding. How do you see this distinction? It seemed to me there was some tension, maybe an attempt to balance the two themes even in your commentary. Yeah, this is a persistent problem that um, Jörg Frey in his recent work has been trying to make the argument that any distinction between the two of them is so slight in John that it's negligible in Mm. terms of, but again, he's talking about a authority or status rather Mm. than identity. Mm. Uh, And so I tend to think that there is a status distinction that continues throughout, but that Jesus is 
this perfect son who just doesn't slip up at all, Mm -hmm. doesn't need to be reconciled with the father, doesn't need to ask God, uh, please don't, don't make me do this, you know, so no Gethsemane moment. Mm -hmm. So Jesus' level of certitude or faith is more pronounced or it it is, there's no ambiguity. There's no questioning of of Mm -hmm. Jesus' confidence that he's following the course of the path that God has laid out. But I can't imagine John is imagining anything like the sort of incarnational theology one sees in Hinduism, where, mm-hmm. you know, when Vishnu incarnates as Krishna, there's no emptying of any sort that's going on. In John, we still have a Jesus who gets tired. We still have a Jesus who cries tears. He gets thirsty. Mm-hmm. We still have enough humanity in Jesus that he's somebody that we can relate to. So, yeah, it's hard to wrap one's head around how this works at a, a level. But there there has to be within the theology some sort of kenosis like you find in, in the Christ hymn in Philippians. That sort of question of then after Jesus dies, what sort of vision does the gospel have for that continuity in, you know, is see building some sort of mythology where Jesus is sitting up in heaven having conversations with God. That doesn't seem to be in the picture. Instead, we have the coming of the Spirit, uh, another parousia. Mm-hmm. For the sake of the audience, let me just pause for a second and explain the kenosis terminology. Uh, So it's the term for emptying in Philippians 2. And the idea is that the divine son, in some sense, mm, loses or lays aside or ceases to exercise certain divine attributes like omniscience and omnipotence and maybe impassibility so that he can genuinely be a human who is in a station like ours where we are limited and challenged in those ways. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. My One, one of my um, beloved philosophy teachers was a proponent of kenosis uh, Christology, mm-hmm. although he owns that it's kind of a radical move in that you're kind of define, you're redefining the divine attributes to make your, uh, your two-nature Christology work out. It can't be part of divinity to be essentially omniscient, for instance, because you're saying that omniscience is losable. It's not essential. Another friend of mine, a Roman Catholic analytic theologian, brilliant and funny guy, I've I've had the privilege of interviewing him a couple of times, and um, he's written one of the, um, I think, best books on incarnation theory, like two natures theory, especially in the ancient world, and he's defending it as coherent, and um, he's totally hostile to all the kenosis stuff. He thinks they thought divinity included impassibility, and so as an essential attribute, and uh, also the other the other things, omniscience, omnipotence. He thinks they would have, you know, the fathers who came together at Chalcedon, for instance, he thinks they would have just rejected that. It's interesting to connect with an earlier point in our conversation. We were mentioning um, some of the earlier interpreters of John, like in the second, early third century. I've done a lot of work on Tertullian and Origen, mm-hmm. and it seems to me they do a very definite kind of Greek type notions about divinity, although Tertullian's a materialist like the Stoics. But um, they do want to say that somebody is genuinely suffering here. Somebody is generally vulnerable, crying, you know, limited in knowledge, you know, who touched me, you know, it's not faking it, mm-hmm. um, doesn't know the day and the hour and the synoptics. They want to say that, but they have such a high notion of the Logos and its divinity that they basically, in their Christology, they have a man, and then they also have the Logos. It looks like you have two selves there, what would later be called Nestorianism. It's because they have to have a sufferer, but they also have to have this divine person in there. To me, it's a total Christological disaster. Like You just can't you can't look at the Gospels, any of them, even this one, and say, hey, there's really two of them, you know, and sometimes this one's talking and sometimes that one's talking. Are you that allergic to the two, uh, <laughs> the two <laughs> sons like I am, the human son and the eternal divine son? Um, I have to make a distinction between 
as an exegete and as a as a human being. Okay. As an exegete, I you know I don't think any of these questions were. You know, John wasn't worried about any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think John could have known what was going to happen as a result of the, some of the language that he did in the sort of debates. I think he'd be quite startled because it wasn't what he was anticipating generating. I don't think he was worried about reconciling these two things. I don't imagine that he saw a problem mm-hmm. in thinking about it in those terms. You know, as a human being, as just me, I'm just so much more comfortable with thinking about Jesus as the person we encounter in Matthew or Luke or Mark mm. than Jesus is the person we encounter in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, he's the resurrected Lord. I'm not all that concerned as an exegete coming up with a reconciliation of these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. That you know, Jesus is represented as something other than God, and praying to God, and as the obedient Son of God, and that sort of model of what we're supposed to be as obedient children is what's being laid out. Mm-hmm. More so in the Synoptic Gospels, where you have much more ethical teaching, but in the Gospel of John, a model of uh, serving others and of how you show love as a friend. So this just wasn't John's problem. I think it's our problem. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in your section about behold the man, Jesus being presented as this victor. And um, I I think it is right that he's, he's more consistently confident here than in the synoptics. But um, yeah, it is definitely a theme in all the gospels that his trust and obedience to God I actually published a paper on this called Jesus as an Exemplar of Faith in the New Mm -hmm. Testament. And uh, it's kind of easy to miss, especially if you're coming at it thinking Jesus is God, because God doesn't need to trust God. I mean, he Mm -hmm. that's a virtue he has no need of. But Mm -hmm. sometimes it's even um, on the lips of his enemies. You know, if he trusts in God, let God save him. But just like they're mocking him as the king in the synoptics when he's on the cross— I think the author intends that to be a divine setup where the bad guys are actually confessing the truth despite themselves. Mm -hmm. And he really does trust in God. Like he, he's about to be vindicated. So yeah, there's a hero aspect to the whole presentation. The star of the gospel is, is a hero of uh, obedience. Same thing in Philippians too, right? Yeah. In fact, when I read Philippians two and the rest of Philippians, I, I think he's kind of, you know, hinting that since we're supposed to have the same mind that's in us, you know, we should be encouraged that we too will be vindicated, not in the same way exactly as, as he was, but, you know, at resurrection and being exalted in a, in a lesser sense, mm-hmm. being vindicated just as well. Yeah. If we look at the gospel of John and the, and we've got this difficulty because Jesus is talking as though he's already done what he's going to do. But there is that sense that the reason why, even in the Gospel of John, that we worship Jesus or recognize Jesus as Lord and give him titles like the ones that Thomas gives in chapter 20 is not because Jesus is the incarnation of God, but because Jesus does the crucifixion, you know, because he's obedient unto crucifixion, that because he dies. Mm-hmm. And in John, the emphasis is thrown on his obedience to death mm-hmm. and not his vindication through resurrection. Mm-hmm. Even his death as his glory, right? Yeah, his death as his glory. Mm-hmm. That act of obedience is his glory. It's not his humiliation. The basis for recognizing Jesus as God's son and Messiah still rests upon not his acts of, you no, know, look, I can turn water into wine, I can heal people. It's because he's willing to demonstrate his love by dying. Mm -hmm. And so it's still, that's the basis for recognizing Jesus' lordship, Mm -hmm. not as of some sort of co-identity with God or the fact that he's a hypostasis of God or this sort of more metaphysical relationship with God. It's because of what he does.
when I read some of those later guys, like the Logos theorists, I get the impression that some of them are really, <clears throat> they want to talk about the Logos and they, they're a bit embarrassed about the topic of Jesus, this Jew who got crucified for seemingly some kind of sedition or something. Mm-hmm. They like to talk about the Logos because that's, you know, this is what inspired all the Greek philosophers and it, you know, it gives rationality to all rational men like ourselves. But it looks like John is like Paul, where he's not ashamed at all of the cross. In fact, that's kind of front and center. And, you know, hey, look at this great victory. This is not something we're embarrassed by. This is kind of the thing we're most interested in, in a sense. Mm-hmm. It fits in the first century context like that, I guess. Yes. Well, Dr. Brand, I uh, really appreciate your time. Your love for this book is evident. It's a gem of a little commentary, and I recommend it. So thanks again for spending time with us and sharing your thoughts with us. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone who listens to this finds it as enjoyable as I found it, the conversation. I, I very much appreciate that this is very much a conversation hmm. and not an interview. Cool. And, you know, it's joining into the commentary tradition by talking about the text, that's what we're invited to do, not just to read it and assent to it, but to argue it out and listen to each other's understanding and keep at it. Amen to that. Well, thank you again for your contribution. Thank you and best wishes. Thanks to Dr. Brandt. Her commentary on John is part of a series called Paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. This week's thinking music has been the track Monarch of the Street by Loyalty Freak Music. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinities podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Until next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.